Okay, yeah, because I'm not, I can't see. And then I do. Okay. Yeah, good evening. Um, I have a message first from uh, Professor Ashford, who's, who suggested that you all come a little closer. Uh, and he indicated the last 30 seats are reserved for the tea party. So I hope uh, <laughs> that maybe encourages you to come down a little bit. Yeah, I'm very pleased that some of you are here. We have uh, midterms. Everybody seems to be in the part of the term where they are knocked out. Um, and I also have to say that, um, like, my group upstairs is working relentlessly to reschedule a field trip that was supposed to happen this week to Japan. And, I mean, you all have heard about the tragedy, and one of our colleagues already is there, John Jonas arrived, like, and it was right the moment when, um, that when the earthquake hit, she was in immigration, and it was a very uh, frightening experience to be at the airport, although... Tokyo was quite far away from Sendai, and we can imagine how it is for the people in that region. And I think it's a very sad moment for many of our students also and their families. So I'm nevertheless very grateful for you to be here, but I also think it, it shows the urgency also to address environmental issues, really. And uh, it's not just uh, natural catastrophes, as we sometimes assume. Uh, saying that, I want to introduce... Um, a former alumni of alumna of our program and uh, a recent um, research fellow at ACT, um, J. Rem Lee. Uh, she graduated in 2006 in our program, came back as a lecturer um, to be the director of the FEMA trailer project, which had to do with the, um, uh, also with what happened in New Orleans in the wake of Hurricane Katrina, but also in um, the follow-up uh, through helping the people by giving them home in FEMA trailers. And uh, I think it's the, to understand the whole complexity of catastrophes and what it involves to engage in uh, what is not um, created by nature but by um, humans and by technology, I think is very crucial. And I think it needs many different disciplines and many bright brains and, uh, I would say, uh, strong responsibilities of each and any of us to address those challenges. Jerem Lee will talk tonight about her Infinity Burial Project um, that proposes an alternative burial system that challenges the death denial and environmental dystopia manifested in existing Western funeral practices. The project consists of the Infinity Mushroom um, Burial Suit the decompi culture kit and the burial system tools that address the full physical realities of death. And you could also see in the lobby of uh, the media complex uh, from the new Maki building, there is uh, the, um, her, her laboratory installed, um, which is basically dealing with um, Jerim's um, attempt to accustom mushrooms to uh, basically digest uh, human tissue and I'm sure you will talk further on that, but if you want to see um, this uh, unit, you can uh, see it for the next uh, two weeks in the market lobby as part of artistic research. Uh, the Infinity Mushroom is a unique strain of fungi trained to digest and remove the industrial toxins in human tissue. Using mycological tissue culture and growing techniques, Lee is training fungi to consume her own body tissue, including skin, hair, nails, and blood. Jerim's project follows a research methodology that includes self-examination, 
transdisciplinary immersion and dialogue and do-it-yourself design, which ultimately take form of living units, furniture, wearables, recycling systems, and personal and social intervention. And this is pretty much uh, part of her um, own studies uh, since the beginning, basically, of her being at MIT and brings together both of her interest uh, in, in uh, sciences uh, related to artistic practice and maybe also one could say to an activist practice. As I said, she's an alumni of uh, the visual arts program that was kind of our predecessor um, and um, in her um, practice as a researcher, she got support from the Creative Capital uh, Foundation and uh, also has been a fellow in the Institute of Raum Experimente at the University of Künste in Berlin uh, that is run by Olaf Eliasson. And she is the recipient of a Max Schindler Center Scholarship and she will uh, leave to LA like um, in the beginning of next month to pursue her studies there. Um, I'm also very pleased to have as a respondent and to welcome uh, Professor Nicholas Ashford, who is Professor of Technology and Policy at MIT, where he teaches courses on environmental law and policy, technology, law and public uh, policy and sustainability, trade and the environment. Dr. Ashford is a faculty associate also at the Center for Technology, Policy and Industrial Development in the School of Engineering, the Institute for Work and Employment Research in Sloan School of Management, and also the Environmental Policy Group in the Urban Studies Department. So basically he informs uh, across disciplines, and I think this is very interesting in relation what we try to do here to really understand that we have to have a dialogue across the disciplines if we want to be even uh, informed about the complexities of those of those challenges. Dr. Ashford is also the author of a major policy work for the Ford Foundation, Crisis in the Workplace, Occupational Disease and Injury, that has been published by MIT Press. He recently co-authored four additional books, Environmental Law, Policy and Economics, and Technology, Globalization, and Sustainable Development, Public Participation and Contaminated Communities. He also published Chemical Exposures, Low Levels and High Stakes, and um, uh, Monitoring the Worker for Exposure and Disease. And um, I think it's really also crucial seeing it in the wake of what's going on at the moment in Japan, because it's the follow-up uh, also of... Um, clearing debris, engaging in facilities that has been exposed uh, to natural catastrophes usually lead to the next uh, problematics. And I think that's very much where I see both of you engaged, although being from different point of departures. And so please let us welcome both and uh, first uh, Chairman Lee. So women cleaned and dressed the body, um, male family members made caskets, 
or the local carpenter was called. And the priest conducted a ceremony, the body was buried, and that's what a traditional funeral looked like. But uh, the North American Civil War um, from 1861 to 65 began to change our burial practices. So dead soldiers needed to be transported home over long distances, so a method to preserve bodies became necessary. Dr. Thomas Holmes, who's considered the father of American embalming, was hired by the Union Army to set up battlefield embalming stations. Um, you know, and this was followed by others, eventually sort of creating a funeral trade. Um, back then, arsenic was the main ingredient used in embalming fluid, um, I guess until about 1910. Um, and this has since turned up in the drinking water and the soil around cemeteries from that era. Um, frequently at levels above acceptable drinking water levels. So, you know, 100 years later, it's still there. Um, and in, in those days, embalming was frowned upon. Um, you know, most viewed it as being unnatural. Uh, but when Abe Lincoln was assassinated in 1865, his body had to travel over, um, over a long distance from Washington, D.C. to Springfield, Illinois, and it took over two weeks to get there. So um, his body was embalmed, and along the way it was embalmed a couple more times um, to inhibit decomposition. And, um, and also the, the train made a couple of stops along the way, and thousands of Americans saw Lincoln's body sort of immaculately, immaculately embalmed, lying in state. This really helped embalming and the new funeral trade to sort of gain acceptance in the public and allowed the industry to flourish. Uh, the next couple of slides are video stills from the 2009 National Funeral Directors Convention trade floor. Um, and today the funeral industry is a $15 billion a year industry that's powered by lobbyists and legislative actors. The industry makes it a point to let us know that it tirelessly crusades against decomposition. So funeral directors talk about creating a lasting memory picture um, through formaldehyde embalming, mortuary makeup, and <clears throat> hundred-year seals on caskets designed not to let anything in or out of the casket. And burial vaults which encapsulate the casket to further protect the body from the so-called elements. Um, in 2009, I attended the National Funeral Directors Convention where I tried to take part in a formaldehyde regulation workshop that was being conducted by two funeral association lawyers. Um, once the organizers realized that I was not a funeral director, I got kicked out without any kind of explanation. And what I learned was going on in the industry at the time was that the industry was in this kind of state of panic because the next month, the National Cancer Institute was set to issue a report based on a 20-year study of death rates among embalmers and other funeral personnel. And the EPA and other agencies have known that formaldehyde is a carcinogen, um, but this study was the first to focus on formaldehyde-based embalming and funeral folks, so it was, it was news for the funeral industry. The report that came out stated that embalmers have significantly higher rates of myeloid leukemia and other health problems. And naturally, the response from the funeral industry was to close ranks, um, become even more secretive, and to try to protect its constituents from lawsuits and regulations. In the handout materials that they provided, the NFDA lawyers stated that they would also fight the EPA and OSHA on any future restrictions on formaldehyde use. Um, since formaldehyde embalming is a mainstay of the funeral industry, um, it's also the major source of revenue. I saw the situation as a missed opportunity for self-awareness and reevaluation by the funeral industry. And sort of a couple of points to me really stuck out about this situation is that, and the first is that the kind of the futility and irresponsibility of using toxic chemicals to hinder decomposition in dead bodies who can't be helped when that process harms living bodies. Um, and that second, that human bodies that are alive are part of environmental systems and nutrient cycles. I think that there was an opportunity here to use this moment to propose a deeper integration um, and discussion of postmortem practices within environmental dialogues, sort of beyond the superficial accounting of the environmental impacts of cremation and mercury distribution into the atmosphere or casket manufacturing or formaldehyde or land use and the like. Um, you know, the funeral, the, the, the field of environmental justice, I think, has historically examined and challenged the unequal distribution of environmental risks and benefits. Um, you know, the classic environmental justice example is the siting of toxic facilities in low-income and minority neighborhoods. 
Um, but to my knowledge, death and postmortem practices have thus, not, and thus far not been discussed in environmental justice circles. But I think we can um, we can note that you know after years of polluting and consuming energy and resources to harm other species and ourselves. When we die, there's no accounting for this usage. Um, and many of us continue to use resources and pollute beyond our deaths um, when we are preserved in formaldehyde or liquid nitrogen, or accumulated toxins in our bodies end up in the soil. So with the burial project, part, partly what I'm trying to do is to kind of propose an expanded, propose an expanded notion of environmental justice that's centered around an equitable distribution of man-made environmental costs, not only among different races of humans, but also among other animals and then the larger environmental grid. But the problem is that thinking of ourselves as being connected to larger environmental systems reminds us that we are physical beings, that we're animals who will shit, who will die, who will decay. Um, something that we don't want to talk about, nevertheless, nevertheless be reminded of. Um, I want to introduce something called terror management theory, which is some of you know is a, a psychology theory um, based on 20 years of research that was inspired by Ernest Becker's um, Pulitzer winning book, The Denial of Death. It's a theory about how our conscious and unconscious awareness of mortality deeply affects our worldviews and relationship to the self. So over the past 20 years, there have been a number of studies that show that um, there's a cascade of psychological events that happens when someone is reminded of death, which um, psychologists kind of in their walking is called mortality salience. Um, so when we're remi reminded of death, um, I think when mortality salience is induced, we cling to those things which bolster our self-esteem and or elevate our status from animals, um, from physical beings to symbolic culture-bound beings. So, you know, when we're reminded of death, we become more nationalistic, we cling to our religions, we objectify women, and the theory proposes that these um, activities protect the psyche from the terror of death. And the body plays a really big role in how we manage sort of these uh, psychological events because the body is, is this kind of constant reminder of our mortality, of our animalness. We, we have sex, we shit, we die, etc. And what terror management theory suggests is that in order to deal with our fear, we distance ourselves from the physicality of our bodies um, and imbue it with symbolic meaning. So the Infinity Burial Project um, began with this kind of goal of confronting death by creating a hybrid mushroom that would act as an agent of decomposition, a symbol of a closer affiliation between the body, the self, and the environment, and an acknowledgement of our connection to the environmental grid by forming an alliance with the master decomposers of the earth, mushrooms. So I imagine that this death mushroom would perform three functions, um, to decompose the body, to remediate toxins in the body, and to deliver nutrients to plant roots. Um, but after consulting with some mycologists, I realized that a hybrid would be kind of near impossible because um, distinct mushroom species are often too old to mingle. Um, they've really evolved not to intermarry very well. Um, so, and, so after I learned that, I decided to take a class with mycologist Paul Stamets, um, which I did last March, and I learned to work with mushroom cultures in the laboratory and, and grow them using various methods. And Paul Stamets is known for his pioneering work in micro reforestation and micro remediation um, that's using mushrooms to clean up toxic sites. He's currently using oyster mushrooms to clean up um, oil spills or training them to clean oil spills. So I learned from Stamets that it's possible to train mushrooms to grow on different substrates, such as food, sub different substrates as food sources, even toxins. So the oyster mushrooms he's working on Right now, the petrochemicals break down the petrochemicals into really innocuous basic elements, carbon, hydrogen, and nitrogen. Um, so I revised the plan to create a strain of an existing edible mushroom that will digest body tissues and remediate toxins. So I'm currently collecting my own hair, skin, and nails um, in a kind of self-experiment with this mushroom. The, the broad term for what I'm practicing with the mushroom is is decompoculture. It's a term that was coined by an entomologist, Timothy Miles, that describes the cultivation of decomposing organisms. So Miles sees the practice of decompoculture as being just as important as agriculture um, in that decomposing organisms break down waste and can provide feed for animals and useful biochemicals, um, as well as to toxify landscapes. The term has actually been 
sort of lost a bit. It was created about 20 years ago, um, but it seems to have disappeared, and Miles seems to have disappeared from the landscape. Um, and many are really practicing the combo culture without really knowing it. So when you know methanogens are cultivated, then methanogens are the bacteria that, that assist the production of biomethane, that's also the combo culture. So the process in training this mushroom um, involves growing mushroom spores on, or mushroom spores or mycelium, which are the roots, um, on a mixture of human tissue and traditional culture medium. So over kind of a succession of generations, the mushroom is going to utilize um, my tissue as a food source. And the work with the mushroom is a, is a kind of subtype of the culture, which I call corpse decomposition. Um, and corpse decomposition for me represents this kind of shift in the relationship to one's body. Um, as a corpse decomposition or decomponent, one becomes an active agent in, in decomposition, um, sort of in spite of mortality salience and, and fear. Um, the corpse decomposition for me is also kind of an acknowledgement of this kind of liminal state between life and death as our cells are constantly dying and regenerating. So right now the work, um, the Infidini mushroom work, takes place in this kind of portable DIY mushroom lab that's in the lobby of the Mackey building. Um, and it's equipped with an autoclave, a clean box that has a laboratory grade HEPA filter, um, an additional sort of room HEPA filter to clean the ambient air, temperature controlled incubators, um, and, and grow boxes. So um, the way I sort of consider how I'm using science here is in a couple of, this is in a couple of different ways. Um, one obviously is that it's a, kind of a simple tool for the development of this mushroom, um, but it, for me it's also kind of a critique of um, the new scientific and technology, technological developments that are arising to meet the demand for life extension in the post-human state, which are all sort of in the in the service of um, making cryonics and immortality viable. So uh, cryonics certainly has a reputation, and for many it seems outlandish, um, but many, many, but more and more of our top technologists and scientists are coming out of the cryonics closet lately, where it seems to me that at least the goal of immortality and the culture of preservation and death denial are becoming an important engine of technology in some ways. Some really some important um, cryonauts include Eric Drexler, who's one of the pioneers of nanotechnology, which cryonics hinges on. Um, Ariane Marvin Minsky, a pioneer of artificial intelligence. Um, Aubrey de Grey, who's a biogerontologist at Cambridge, who developed um, SEN, the SENS Foundation, which is uh, and SENS is a tissue repair strategy intended to rejuvenate the human body and allow an indefinite lifespan. Uh, Ray Kurzweil is also a cryonaut. He's an inventor, he's a futurist, um, and the founder of the Singularity University. So cryonics really, you know, it's, it's the kind of ultimate manifestation of death denial. Um, I think it's a faith-based technology for the non religion. So um, in reviving cryonauts, um, and cryonauts call this revivification, reanimation, ultimately depends on that nanotechnology. So, if you're counting on technology to make you immortal, and the application of that technology is speculative, um, you're treading a fine line between science and religion. Ray Kurzweil speaks of the need to prepare for the coming of the singularity, a time when technology will pass, will surpass human ability, this kind of post-human age in which cryonics will be viable. Um, to me, <laughs> the notion that post-humanism and cryonics are part of some kind of utopian future is something that needs to be challenged. Um, among many things, I think that it's a move toward less environmental justice as it extends the negative impact we have on the environment, among other things. And, and you know, personally, in my utopian future, a mushroom eats my body and remediates my toxins. So the first iteration of the project was a burial suit um, customized for my body. It's made of cotton and it's more embroidered with thread that's been infused with mushroom spores. Um, in this case, the oyster mushroom. The embroidery pattern resembles that of the mushroom mycelium growth, and this is the kind of dendritic pattern that you see on, on, on tree trunks. Where mycelium is the fungi equivalent of plant roots. The suit is accompanied by an alternative embalming fluid, which is just simply a slurry of mushroom spores. Um, 
So the mushrooms on the inside of the body grow towards the mushrooms on the outside of the body, um, sort of facilitating decomposition and alleviating toxins. Uh, these images are the suit taken at the Museum of Science. So, you know, with these images, the suit also became, for me, an object onto which I could project different possible futures for the work. Um, that's, you know, the first one being using mushroom, the mushroom death suit um, in space to decompose bodies. This sounds a little bit far-fetched, but um, mushrooms are actually ideally suited for space because they require very little light and use proportionally fewer resources um, and space than plants. So, and also many are medicinal and provide more protein and micronutrients than most of their plant counterparts. So thinking about sort of this mushroom death suit and in space also led me to the idea of uh, thinking about a possible parallel function for the infinity mushroom. So since I'm training these mushrooms to digest human tissue, I realized that the mushroom could also be a biofilm digester for space travel, where biofilm is the kind of the sweat, um, hair, skin cells, and bacteria, and mushrooms that get sloughed off the body and then start to accumulate um, in inhabited spaces like, the, you know, like space shuttles or your shower ball. So NASA currently uses these vacuums to clean up the biofilm so you have astronauts spending, you know, like once a week or once a day sort of vacuuming up the, the biofilm from the walls and then it gets stored in these bags and then they carry back to Earth. Um, but, you know, because I'm training the mushroom to eat human tissue, I think it could be a natural biofilm digester. And once they're done digesting the biofilm, um, you can potentially eat it. So I think this also sort of points to the potential for this project and for, I think, art in general to produce kind of functionality and knowledge in other um, areas aside from the funeral industry. So right now I'm working with an organization that has a contract with NASA to place these kind of small cube structures aboard the International Space Station for small-scale experiments in microgravity um, and, and they're a commercial venture. So the, this kind of cube lab, um, for me, will be a first step in testing the functionality <coughs> of the mushroom in outer space. Um, and it has, it would have sort of these sensors to test, you know, the growth of the mushroom and um, to, to see sort of what the conditions are in microgravity. The mushroom, I'm also sort of thinking of using it in uh, a bigger decomposition kit, which is kind of a compilation of different bacteria and fungi and non-toxic chemicals um, that are involved in the decomposition process. And so, um, so the parts of the decomposition kit will be housed in these kind of individual capsules, which together would form a cocktail of decomposers. And they would sort of exist as capsules that could then be distributed modu modularly. Um, the the decomposition kit could also be used in other sort of products, and one could be decomposition makeup. Um, the image on the right is of more tourer cosmeticians and their and their handiwork. So um, so the decomposition kit would contain spores and other organisms, and you know where the makeup would ex exist as this kind of dry powder, and then. You would mix it with a liquid nutrient solution, so it becomes a sort of liquid foundation. I went at the convention, in the National Funeral Breakfast Convention in 2009. I also attended um, a makeup, um, makeup, a mortuary makeup workshop, um, where they talked about makeup um, as, as a tool for death denial, where they, you know, use the makeup to make the body look like it's asleep, um, to you know, to create that lasting memory picture. So over the past year or so, various people have expressed to me um, an interest in the mushroom or, and or offered to be a subject in a project um, that is to be buried with my mushroom or in a burial suit. Um, and I think this interest to me reflected uh, a certain kind of belief or acceptance of death and its physical realities, a certain relationship with nature. Um, and I realize that a certain perspective is kind of a prerequisite for being receptive to the project and its methods. Um, so I launched the Decompoculture Society with the purpose of understanding and cultivating that perspective, um, and it's in a sense kind of rounding up some of the early adopters, whom I'm calling the Decompanots. Um, so where like cosmonauts and astronauts explore outer space, um, psychonauts explore inner states of consciousness, Decompanots would explore death and decomposition. Um, 
so the, the society is really modeled, modeled after the memorial societies um, that developed after Chester, Jessica Mitford's book, The American Way of Death, came out in the 1960s. Um, and the memorial societies allowed consumers to bulk purchase funeral options at a discount. So the first event of the, of the society was um, a workshop on postmortem options. And so we had um, representatives from the Green Burial Movement, um, someone from New England Burials at Sea, and you know, women who, a woman who sells eco-caskets and promotes home funerals sort of talking about different funeral options. The, the workshop for me also was sort of, it was a way to sort of recruit members of the society, but also kind of a, a, an opportunity to enter into a, a deeper dialogue with the funeral industry. So as part of the, the, the society, there's a, a website, a community, and a blog. Um, and on that blog is a survey um, designed to sort of get a better understanding of who the decompanauts are, and who the members of the society are. So just in, in terms of some of the results of this study, I, I found that nearly all the people who um, want to be decompanauts have thought about what would happen to their bodies after death. Um, but most have not made any plans. Um, they see a connection between bodies and environmental systems. Um, and many are artists and architects, but you know, that kind of reflects who the community is. So um, our next workshop will be one on preservation. So um, postmortem practices that focus on preserving the body in various ways, whether it be through cryonics or um, anatomical <coughs> donation or kind of alternative embalming solutions. Um, or mummification. Yeah, I will ask um, Professor Ashford to join as a respondent. And then afterwards, we will have the opportunity for hopefully many um, questions. And uh, I also have to say, very often, like when we when we supported Jerem's uh, work very early on, and even for her um, thesis work, I sometimes got asked because um, her thesis work dealt also with um, it was a self-sustainable kind of like. Um, diet that would um, create kimchi that then also support uh, the needs specifically of Jerim's body in terms of nutrition. So it really deals with like uh, environmental issues and I got asked then, but what does this have to do with art or culture? And I have to say, I mean, if you have seen this, you will understand how much culture very often is instrumentalized to support lobby groups, to support a certain industry. Because if we have this, this, this are like our burial practices, our cultures, our like diets, our cultures, to be um, forever young is a culture. And we support that with a lot of what we do and what we practice. So I think to approach a number of those issues, we also have to go through cultural channels in order to change those cultures and um, to really address uh, more environmental friendly um, solutions I think I'm very thankful that artists uh, take up the challenge but now with no um, further ado I want to welcome Professor Ashford for his response well I'm very happy can you hear me very happy to be here um, uh, the invitation to be a respondent came out of the blue, and uh, that's good because uh, it, it got me to thinking about some things. I enjoyed the presentation. Uh, just some random thoughts of what went to my mind while you were, were talking. First, a reference to the ancient Greeks. Uh, in a battle, if you slayed your opponent, you had to honor his body by burying him. You, I mean, you insulted the gods if you did not give him a proper burial. And I, I sat here and wondered how far we've come, you know, with the commercial industry that you talk about and thinking about life and death, how far we've come and yet how far we've not come. By the way, uh, Greece is built on a rock, so there's very little land bury people in. 
And what they would do typically in Greece is, is bury a person and then five years later you would go and be and receive your loved one's bones polished and returned to you in a bag so that somebody else could occupy that ground. Only recent did, recently did the Greek Orthodox Church finally agree to uh, cremation because it for centuries had been against that because it insulted the body, but there's no more land left in Greece to bury people, so there this seemed to have necessitated that. Um, Jessica Mefford's work was something I was familiar with for a long time ago. If I mean, she had presented people propped up in rocking chairs and stuff that was part of the mythology of, of the death uh, viewing of the body. Um, <clears throat> what occurred to me also as you were talking was, what, what do you do with a body? Well, uh, modern technology now allows you to convert all of the carbon in your body to a diamond and leave it to your spouse or your girlfriend or your children. Now, this is Uncle George. He's, I'm wearing his diamond. I'm wearing him on my ring. And I'm not sure I know what, what to do with that. It's, uh, it gets you to thinking. The other thing which comes to mind, my mind was racing as you were talking, was what about cloning? I mean, does the body disappear if you clone an individual and... Uh, perpetuates his life in, in, in that way, right? So we have now turning people into diamonds and turning people into uh, a vest pocket edition of themselves. Um, certainly we have not come to grapple with the cycle of life, which includes death. And I'm reminded here also that we're against euthanasia technically in this country, but we tell our the loved one is dying and our physicians say, well, let us give him a little more morphine to ease the pain. Of course, he's not feeling any pain, right? So the morphine slows the heart down and we live under the fiction that we are not committing euthanasia. Uh, uh, being of European descent originally, I have to, I have to wonder at the total denial that the American culture lives under, of which is it epitomized by, by, by death. Um, certainly, the Democrat inside me says people ought to be able to have a choice with regard to what they want to do with their body. After all, it is their body, not that of the funeral director or even their relatives, right? If I wanted to be buried in my in the backyard of my house, you still have to embalm me. If I want to be cremated, you still have to embalm me. And then finally, I have to <clears throat> personalize this whole discussion because in the late seventies, when the in the late eighties, when the Reagan administration had come in to get industry uh, government off the backs of industry and to fight regulation. I wrote an article in Science, which, um, and we didn't know this until we talked tonight, which exposed the failure of the federal government to properly control formaldehyde, which is a carcinogen. It's now a confirmed human carcinogen. It's the 26th most commonly used chemical. It's in the toothpaste that you will go home tonight and brush your teeth with unless you buy Tom of mains. It is in all kinds of medicines. The formaldehyde lobby, um, earlier in my career at MIT, I've been here 38 years, worked tirelessly to get me denied tenure at MIT because I had exposed the government for not properly regulating formaldehyde, including, by the way, in trailers where people live and the formaldehyde particle board degasses and people have a nice tight compartment where the formaldehyde concentration can reach a very high level. But I think, and you refer to the funeral industry, it is really cradle to grave that they're involved in. I mean, they are involved in 
the chemicals for birth, the chemicals for conception, the chemicals for uh, keeping us from one from one sickness while giving us another, and then they are terribly involved in the whole death. Uh, industry as well. If they have a way to make money in the afterlife, I'm sure they will find it. I'm sure they will find it. So formaldehyde um, now, and then finally, and I have to tell you, you know the Koch brothers, who are the fifth and sixth most wealthy people in the United States and together have more money than Bill Gates, have got a new cancer institute here at MIT. They are the ones who um, support the Tea Party and the anti-union movement in Wisconsin. But more important to the discussion here, they are involved in urging the deregulation of formaldehyde while they sponsor a so-called cancer institute that will look at everything but prevention. Everything but prevention. Selling you, along with... Um, other mythologies like sending mirrors into space to reflect the sun to prevent global warming, uh, selling you the idea that you can make a pharmaceutical to fit your genes which can solve your cancer. Not in my lifetime, and I bet not in any of our children's lifetime. The National Cancer Institute, the American Cancer Institute, are complicitous with the chemo pharmaceutical agency to promote everything other than prevention. So when somebody offers you a daffodil in the spring, do not buy it. Because they do not believe in prevention. And chemically related cancer continues to be a major increasing problem. I mean, when you detect cancer earlier, the five-year survival period, of course, will be exceeded. But you actually haven't saved anybody's life. Now, I'm sure your art does not deal with these ruminations of an old professor at MIT. But anyway, thank you for inviting me, and I really enjoyed your presentation. I think you both tackled very crucial topics here, and I actually have um, another um, young colleague, and she works actually with um, the, um, the cosmetic industry in order, because of course a lot of cosmetics and cosmetics industry is a huge industry, is also using... Um, and unregulated. Unregulated, yes. and not only animal um, testing products, no. but also a lot of formaldehyde and, and other issues. and. Um, other chemicals, and um, they really try to develop um, more um, biological, environmental friendly, um, um, I would say, cosmetics. And, and uh, again, you're facing a lot of, um, I would say, like uh, stops by the, the lobbies. And, and I think it's really, to me, it's stunning from which end basically the, the resistance to that comes. I mean, it's, it's, it's young uh, stylists or so, and, and they work against a huge lobby in order to change our culture. And, and I think if we don't reach out to the so-called consumer, to the individuals, giving those informations, people very often even don't know. I mean, there, there is not so much knowledge around. And maybe you can say a little bit like why I think this, this knowledge is also... I mean, not so much in the media, etc. I mean, like, you know it, so other people know it. Why is it not out there? Well, the media is complicitous because they get their advertising money from the technologies that are these anti-social technologies. We, I mean, uh, we, don't, we do not have a free press in this country uh, with regard to balancing the messages that we get. I mean, it's not possible. Stories on, if you read the newspapers, the number of inches and the number of audio and TV time devoted to global warming, which is a problem, would make you believe that it is the only environmental problem. And in fact, 
it is not the only environmental problem, and it is not the only environmental problem for which we have exhibited a, a, a tipping point. Endocrine disruption, which is changing the basic reproductive health of humans and other organisms alike, uh, is, at a, is at a crisis stage. More children than ever are born with undescended testicles. More children than ever before are born bisexual, for which surgery corrects them into external women. Gender bending is a real event with regard to chemicals. And uh, autism, autism and chemical sensitivity, I mean, and autoimmune disease. What is autoimmune disease? The body rejects itself. It actually is improperly prepared to deal with chemicals which initially cause brain damage. There will be a time not too long from now when we understand that chemical toxicity is a major threat to every living thing. And everybody is paying their attention on global warming. By the way, um, the Koch brothers are intent on deregulating formaldehyde for a very specific reason, and that is ethanol-based fuels produce acetaldehyde and formaldehyde. And so if we're going to pay attention to the corn lobby and have them be the source of our energy independence, the carcinogens that are produced are every bit as bad as benzene and their products from the petrochemical industry. We are not told the truth, although you can find the truth. But and finally, we'll end with a, with a comment uh, again about Greece. When the junta took over Greece, they took over all of the press, all the domestic press. They put the editors in jail. But they allowed Time Magazine and Le Monde and Der Spiegel on the, on the um, newspapers, stands. And they, somebody said, why are you allowing these, art, these uh, pieces of journalism? They're against you. And they, they make uh, persuasion that you should be replaced. They said, listen, it was 1964. Anybody who's, who speaks anything other than Greek in 1964, they're against this anyway. Let them enjoy their newspapers. Now, let me tell you what the translation is. Let them enjoy their Washington Post. Let them enjoy their New York Times. But that isn't where public opinion is formed. We live in Cambridge in a cocoon. This is not Des Moines. This is not Springfield. This is not Alabama. The press is controlled and is complicitous in depriving us of a balanced perspective from the funeral industry to environmental uh, global warming to environmental toxicity. We have the illusion that we are living in a country with a free press, and we are not. Just maybe add a little bit to that, the food industry. I mean, there's like, if, if we look up the composite of uh, food today, I mean, you really wonder how much uh, is natural in the food and how much is uh, basically coming out of laboratories. I think that's another very strong lobby, specifically here in the United States. And and I think it, that's another, like, very big concern. I mean, if you speak about autism and so, so there's, it's already an, an understood that a lot uh, of what we eat also leads to a certain kind of in, um, in fact inflammation of the brain and uh, which also has a certain relationship to increasing number of um, autism and so I think there is a lot that is interconnected here but is very often treated very separately yeah. and maybe again also Jeremy you started off basically with, with food you were addressing sleep and like then slowly, like you moved on to the FEMA trailers, like work, working in uh, New Orleans, which let you understand the problematic that are caused by the FEMA trailers in the formaldehyde containment. Maybe you can talk a little bit like how your trajectory was to all of those issues. Um, well, it began with a kind of interesting um, sort of why we didn't ourselves in our bodies, what the body, why the body is so problematic, and sort of how we think about the environment and what our relationship is to the environment. And um, 
you know, over the sort of the course of a, a couple of years, I, I realized that, um, or I learned, I came to sort of understand that death really plays a large part in, in our kind of relationship to the environment and how we think about um, what our culpability <coughs> is in terms of um, environmental problems. Yeah, or what you said, like, I mean, I remember when you had your uh, final thesis, you were producing, um, you were also offering kimchi that has been produced in your uh, self-sustainable unit, and of course it was um, fertilized by your urine, and uh, the, the reviewers were hesitant uh, to, to eat the kimchi, because I thought, this is a little bit suspicious, and so... And when we were asking them, like, so why don't you hesitate to eat whatever is uh, on a plate in a restaurant? Uh, you don't know uh, how it has been treated, where it comes from, and what it contains. They had no problem. So how do you think, like, this alienation happened, that we're having more fear of, like, what our own body produced that we know, and we basically are familiar, like, what our bodies contain, and as you said, like... A, our urine, our shit, etc. Why should that be more scary than uh, what you get offered in a very alienated way? Why do you think that happened? I, I, you know, I'll say it, I think it really goes back to this kind of fear of death. And that, that's why I think you know, there's um, an anthropologist at NYU, NYU who talks about why we throw waste and why we um, look down on sanitation workers and that waste we, we fear waste because we fear death, and waste kind of represents, you know, and proposes to us that our bodies are also kind of waste, and that our, our the products of our bodies are also waste, and so we are part of that that stream. Um, we're part of these environmental cycles, um, and so, you know, so I think that it really goes back to this kind of fear of death. But I also want to mention that we have a room a microphone, so I'm sure there are some um, also questions or comments here uh, with our guests, with our public. I actually have a question. Here. Um, so I think it seems like uh, sort of the mounting evidence um, around body burden. You know, the CDC has a biomonitoring yeah. program that tests for testing, I think, 200 chemicals now in the body. Um, in, 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 in serum and urine and, and other body tissues. And um, I wonder, like, it seems to be the most compelling argument for regulating chemicals. And I wonder what what's happening that, you know, that that evidence isn't being used or is not being effective. You know, what, do you have any sort of suggestions or ideas for why and how that can be Well, Obama has appointed some very good people to head the regulatory agencies, much better than what we had in the past. <clears throat> but we are in economic meltdown, and the administration and state government <clears throat> is afraid to propose any kind of short-term burden on the economic system. And I also believe <clears throat> that the chemical industry supports dramatically the attention on global climate change because it diverts attention from what they, in fact, are doing. So, yes, there is conspiracy and complicity, but also paralysis with regard to doing things which should be done to protect people, but also let me remind you of the mundane observation that uh, four weeks ago, the head of the part of the TARP program that was supposed to help homeowners, homeowners out of their mortgage, renegotiate their mortgage and save them in their homes, resigned, calling that part of the program a total failure. Well, the bank part of the program was not a total failure, but the TARP program, many of you may not know, had a significant amount of money dedicated to saving three million homeowners from, and it never got off the ground. And where is the population? I mean, how can we sit back? First of all, not only jail, no jail time for these bankers, but also that ordinary people are losing their whole life savings and their ability to function. And we are asleep. I mean, 
you know, we're asleep. It's not, I don't, I don't understand it unless there's formaldehyde in the drinking water, you know. Do you have us a question by John? You have to hold it close to the mouth. amongst all the, um, the organizations that we've looked at or what that you've shown us that will confront the, the, uh, the chemical industry and especially the so-called death industry. I mean, is there any kind of movement to organize together and, and really stand up and be counted so that the American people can understand what's going on? Because... <coughs> You know, they're not speaking with one voice, as we know, with the four five lists. I mean, what is your hunch, or do you have any idea of how they may be behaving in the future? Can you clarify what you mean by the organizations that, which, which organizations? The, well, the organizations which uh, you have listed that are um, interested in um, in addressing the um, burial uh, or the death, the, the counter, the practices of the death industry. You, have you, alternative practices. You mean the people who participated in the workshop, for example? Yeah. Mm. Well, there's, I think that the kind of the unified group is the Korean Burial Council. Uh -huh. um, well, that was at the top of your list. Right. And they're, you know, they're coordinating and developing um, the sort of the, the disparate efforts that people are engaging in, whether it's to, to build land trusts so that green burial or green cemeteries can be established. Um, there's one that they're currently working on in Western Mass, um, or whether it's sort of working with um, to make legislative changes in terms of allowing green burials or uh, you know, changing the requirements to have a funeral director and to have embalming happen in, in different states. So there's sort of that kind of effort um, that the Green Burial Council is sort of hurting. If you can establish an alternative death industry or in any state, Oregon, or if you can establish it, if it gets a foothold in one or two states, then I think you have a chance of turning it upside down. Otherwise, you know the adage, we have the best government money can buy. And it does. I'm reminded in Massachusetts years ago, you may remember, there was a packaging initiative. And the idea was to force the amount of packaging that's in CDs and everything that we buy to be greatly reduced in volume number one, number two, to be made partly of recyclable content, and number three, to force recycling of the materials so there would be replaceable things. And I did an analysis of that for, the, for Ralph Nader's public interest research group. Our analysts took about $25,000 to do an analysis of why everybody would benefit in Massachusetts except, of course, the packaging industry. But wholesalers would benefit, consumers would benefit. I said $25,000. The packaging industry spent $5 million to defeat the initiative. You may remember red tape coming out of ceilings in grocery stores and all. I mean, if you just can, can you get the message and repeat the message, there's no global warming, you're going to, uh, drown in paperwork if you have repackaging, you can defeat these public measures because people have lost the ability to think critically. And we live in a blue state or light blue or purple. I'm not sure what color it is anymore with one senator. Anyway, uh, I think uh, we, 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 we have, we, you know, like Pogo said, we have met the enemy, and it is us. But money is extraordinarily powerful, and the press 
is extraordinarily complicitous. And we have, I mean, it was once asked by the labor unions what they could do. This was before we lost so many members. What they could do to basically improve the strength of the right kinds of views. And my answer to them was very simple. I said, try to buy USA Today. USA Today could not be bought by a coalition of labor unions and environmental groups, which is what we needed to do. It would not sell to that group of people. We have no national public interest media. National Public Radio is like the New York Times was in Greece. Let them have their NPR, because nobody's going to listen to it anyway and not be. Although I know, I know that the, um, the, 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 the listenership is, is, is up. But you know, they're doing very hard not to present themselves as a left-wing uh, propaganda machine. You know, a balanced news media is against the interest of the right wing. It's, you don't have to be left. If you're balanced, this is, this is not tolerable. This is not tolerable. Because a balance shows the bankruptcy of these ideas. And uh, you know we may be losing the republic. We're in a very, very precarious position. Very precarious position. I fear for the republic. Question and it's been partially answered, um, but um, I'd like you to elaborate a little bit more. I'd like to know if, um, if this lobbyists you have mentioned have succeeded in rendering like alternative imperial methods ideal. And I also like you to tell us if, if uh, some of these uh, alternative methods are already undergoing like a you know, isolated practice somewhere in America or other countries. I'm not an American. So I don't know very well, and uh, I'd also like to know if they are linked to ancient imperial techniques, which a professional has mentioned a little bit, the one you mentioned, please. Thank you. Um, so there are a number of alternative methods of burial, um, you know, and, alternative met and alternatives for existing burial practices. I mean, one, there is this alternative of long so if it's iron based was developed in the UK that's supposedly non-toxic, but that um, inhibits decomposition, nevertheless, although at a slower rate. Um, there's, you know, there's a growing green barrel movement in the US that advocates for sort of simple, you know, shroud burials or, you know, burial in, in, in pine caskets without embalming. Um, there are a number of green burial cemeteries in the US. There's one um, I visited in California, in Marin County. Um, but can you repeat your second part of the question? Uh, well, first part was if, if the lowest of this obvious among the high and such uh, industry, like uh, I did, have, have they succeeded in banning like like legally like the alternative processes? Because sometimes that kind of stuff happens in other countries. In the country I come from, most people are very uh, concrete boats with aluminum, aluminum caskets, and I find it uh, you know, terrifying. You know? Well, the laws vary by state. So, in some states, you have, you know, you're required to have a funeral director who embalms the body, who, um, and the body is buried in a concrete lined casket with a grave liner. Um, in a cemetery, it's sort of over, and the whole process is overseen by a funeral director. Um, but you asked me about what kind of legislative changes have happened. For Yes, if it's legal or basically my question, it's it totally legal in America to do an alternative burial or not, like you're proposing? Yeah, it depends on the, it depends on the state. Yeah. You know, the biggest impetus for change in the funeral industry has been an economic one, and that you know, <coughs> the price of funerals that hovers around $10,000 for a traditional casket embalming grave liner method. Um, and that has been Is, is an economic one. And so, you know, in, um, 
in I think 2008, most like 70% of burials were casted, and like I think 20 something were um, were with cremation. And um, the projected estimate for cremations in 2020 is 50% cremation. And so that's a big uh, it's a big loss for the funeral industry in terms of revenues. And so it's something that they're trying to they're you know they can't legislate it, they can't legally um, stop the rise of cremation, but they can. You know, what they're trying to do is make money in other methods by offering web memorials and um, selling other kind of trinkets. You know, with the aging population, <clears throat> the insight is that death is a growing industry. <laughs> so you're not going to give up this practice just at a time when the statistics are in your favor, are you? I mean, no sane businessman would ever do that. I was wondering about burial at sea. How far out do you have to go when you're permitted to toss the body not, in? Not that far, actually. <laughs> in California, I think it's less than two miles. And in Massachusetts, it's like three or four miles. Well, you know, here's a strategy. Have people start to be buried at sea and have the bodies you know, end up on Revere Beach, and then it'll create a, a public response for more alternative methods, which do not include just saying, well, look, couldn't afford to bury him, couldn't afford to embalm him, took him out two and a half miles. Now it's your problem, right? So, so scandal, is that what you're saying? No, so you create a scandal. You, you bury people at sea and you get a public response. But, but just as a side comment before we go to the, there was one up there question, yeah, like with him. And, <laughs> and I just want to mention, like, because in Europe we have a lot of cremation, and actually that also causes a problem because our bodies are not less toxic when we get uh, burned. So cremation also, like, there is very um, strong regulation on filters, then the problems are the caskets. I mean, they still sell um, caskets that, that are produced in a not very environmental way to burn them, to pollute again. Why do you need a casket to bury a body? You don't need one. Look, so we, we again, there is, Europe is not that much better having a strong cremation uh, policy. Many places we prohibit the burning of solid waste. You burn organic material, you get dioxins. Dioxins are natural. I mean, you cannot avoid mm -hmm. this. I mean, that's why many uh, regions, I mean, don't allow the burning of paper anymore. Well, you'd burn paper, you burn a body, there's no distinction. I mean, this is, this is you get the same organic. Except for the mercury filling. Except for the mercury fillings. Well, power plants do their share of that, too. <laughs> so there goes a question. Could be changed a little bit so that that's not part of it. But in terms of, I didn't know you had to be involved before you were committed. I think that's only in some states. So you should check out which state we want to die in. What's the question? If you have to be cremated in Massachusetts before you get, um, you have to be embalmed before you get cremated. I don't think that's the law in Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. as as but you know, like every year, I think what the statistic is that 5,000 pounds of mercury are emitted into the environment from cremations alone. From fillings. From, yeah, from fillings and mm -hmm. just anything, whatever else is in the body. Um, is there a solution to that problem? Well, like we mentioned, there's the filters, and there's some regulation around um, you know, filters being uh, installed in, in crematory. And the EPA, with all of the burden that it has upon it, is going to be monitoring those smokestacks, right? speculation and then an actual question uh, for Jay Ray. Um, um, 
first of all, another person very interested in becoming a phenomenon, and um, uh, not just uh, as a, a subject, but um, as a as a microbial. I have to admit, I was kind of hoping you had some uh, Pleurotus austriatus uh, samples here. Maybe soon take your um, uh, your, your project was maybe written, I don't know, some, some time ago. I was wondering, I was kind of hoping you might have some uh, uh, human-grown uh, oyster mushrooms uh, that uh, we could, could saute up or something. <laughs> I, I, would, I, I would take the plunge. Um, and then uh, I wanted to ask you about your, um, uh, how Michael Moorish maybe your um, uh, trips to funeral industry conventions uh, either have become or will have to become in the future. Do you, are, you, are you going to be going or are you going, going under your own name or how, how surreptitious um, or have, have you had to be or going to be? Well, the, the first one, well, the only one that I've been to was the, the one in 2009, and I went um, honestly with the intention of shooting video for a documentary that I've sort of been considering thinking about death denial and the funeral industry and our postmodern choices. So I sort of, that's how I presented myself as somebody who was interested in the industry, um, and I was being forthright in that. But I didn't, you know, when I introduced myself to people, I didn't tell them that I was also working on this other thing, and that I was interested in kind of challenging and critiquing the, the funeral industry, but that I was, you know, I sort of talked about my, my interest in these different options. Um, you could go to mortuary school. I could. Yeah. I went to grief and bereavement, summer death camp. <laughs> summer. So I, I, I have sort of done this kind of um, these little forays into the industry sort of on my own. Um, my next, um, my plan for the next funeral industry association conference is to sort of present my actual work and on the trade floor to sort of present these mushrooms and the burial makeup alongside, you know, the mortuary makeup and um, just sort of like present it and recruit for decompetence among funeral directors. But again, as another side comment, I also want to uh, mention um, the artist Mel Chin, for example, who, who has been an inspiration also to a number of our students. And uh, Mel Chin worked um, with uh, plants that are super depolluters, actually, to, to get um, heavy metals out of uh, soil. And uh, again, there was a strong lobby against uh, those plants, uh, which would be much cheaper to, to get rid of, like uh, toxic earths, etc. And or if you take the German artist Joseph Beuys, who tried this for the Hamburg Harbor, to use plants in order to, to clean the soil, and which actually is fairly fast, uh, if you imagine the, the, the toxins we're talking about. And again, it has been repressed, and to me it's quite interesting that, um, for example, the um, Mel Chin could help scientists that uh, who, who couldn't get research money anymore to continue certain research through the symbolic capital of the artist to bring it back to the media through other channels, at least in Germany, to focus more on those plans again. And so I just wonder if there could be some alliances between artists and scientists to get the word out. I mean, I, I understand, Professor Ashford, you're a little bit pessimistic on that end because we talked to the converted, but we have to begin somewhere. What do you think? I mean, do, do you see an opportunity? I mean, basically that we have both of you here is like that we think something should be done and we hope something could be done just to raise the awareness and um, to, if, we, if we all give up, I mean. I don't say we give up, but I think you have to choose your venue. It could be Oregon, could be California, could be Holland. I mean, choose the venue where the, the, the issue has the greatest success, chance of succeeding. I don't know the situation in UK since Mitford wrote her book. I don't know whether they, you know, retreated into a safer position and, and you have to embalm in order to, to, uh, uh, to cremate. The, the UK cremation is, the, I think, the, the preferred method of uh, disposing of a body. Yeah. But if you choose your venue so that, because the world is connected, you start to see people doing things, say, well, we want to do what they do in Holland or in Oregon, then I think you could do it. But I think you can't declare war on the universal funeral industry because they, they've got too much in stake. But you have to choose your battleground, and that takes some political strategizing. I 
think it's important. There was a question very up there. Yeah. I think very interesting uh, possible future. And it also uh, presents opportunities for change. Uh, Could you talk louder? Yes, sorry. <laughs> Yeah, I'll say that the, I think that the project presents some very interesting opportunities uh, for change, especially in land use. Um, you can think of um, burial sites almost as future plants uh, for growing of vegetables or even uh, like infinity certified paper. Um, have you <laughs> any thoughts in that kind of direction? In the, the human as a nutrient of another industry. Mm. Well, I mean, the, the, the core concept is that humans have become compost. Um, and so then there's that. But no, I haven't sort of thought about humans being nutrients for um, other products. That, that's not something I thought of. But um, the Green Burial Movement has, you know, a significant part of the Green Burial Movement is this idea of using um, green cemetery land as, to, as, as a way of making land, conservation land. Um, and so then they, they sort of utilize green burial in this other way. Um, but no, I haven't thought of turning my, turning bodies into, it's too soil like green for me. And I think I'm trying to <laughs> avoid, avoid that system. I wonder if the Native Americans don't have something to contribute here. They are they show enormous respect for the body. They, they have respect for the land and the environment. Uh, we tend not to pay any attention to what they think or do. Um, but maybe culturally, they have something to contribute to this debate. It would be interesting to know. They have. And, and uh, the issue is really here like that. This is why I said like we have to see it on a much larger scale because the problem is like that our bodies in the past we for for ten thousands of years we could deal with dying bodies we all always died, but because uh, of the 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 food we eat the the products we use in our bodies the animals we eat are like they're very heavily toxified and the the problem is like what we have already in our body when we die and. In the past, like people wouldn't be that toxified when they died, so it really has. We have to start earlier. We have to start with like uh, what we eat, what we put into our bodies. I mean, it's we. Cherim is now at the end, but when her project started, it was like with food. So I think it's really crucial that we look on the much lot on the way larger picture here and. This is why I mentioned Melchin, uh, also in, in terms of the use of plants, etc. We had this knowledge once, and I don't want to sound too green here, but I think um, we have to address those issues and we have to look into other solutions. And I'm not so sure if, if, if technology of, of how we see it here in this institute is the only solution if we don't have to combine green knowledge with technologies. I'm reminded of a bill of... Uh Oh gosh, Bill Moyers had a program. He actually submitted his body to an examination of 200 toxics that were done at uh, Mount Sinai Hospital. Um, we, we have inherited a lot of fat soluble and tissue soluble toxins and they are, we are, we have them in the body and if they, they are implicated in a lot of diseases which have not been should we say ready for, fi for, for prime time. But they're involved with endocrine disruption, they're involved with uh, predisposition to cancer and a whole variety of other things. But uh, again, you know, today it's global warming and the economy. And it's hard to know how either one of those things is gonna get solved uh, or go on the back burner. There's, it's got a lot of cachet. But as someone who was trained originally as a chemist and then became a, a lawyer, I mean, I knew how to write the molecular orbital structure for benzene, but I did not know it caused leukemia until I became a lawyer. It tells you something about the educational process, doesn't it? Are there, yeah, there's one question. Um, <clears throat> like, 
I wonder, there is a, um, the, the considerations whether how, how to deal with all those addition to the body now that people have, you know, talking about, you know, venture feelings and so on, but we start to put a lot of things in our body to make old people or sick people kind of uh, keep on living, including skills and all these kind of things. And when you, all, all those methods, do you take that into consideration? Because that is one of the story that make, that make a dead body a kind of basically medical waste. So uh, as we die older and older, I would say the proportions of our body in those days would increase. I, I don't think the body contains enough toxic waste to be a, a threat to others. It's a threat to the person when he's walking around with them. Well, if you don't, before you burn it, it doesn't. But if you incinerate and so on, it will change the, the chemical composition. Well, you get dioxin as a primary, people, yeah. Let's say if you put it in food, but you put it in, in compost, but if you have pieces of steel and things, and you would put it into, you know, pastures and so on. Your, your animal would, would, you know, all these kind of, I don't know, you, you, you would end up with a bunch of things that do not really, not digested by any kind of mm. mushrooms and things. But that is the interesting part, I think, on the mushrooms, that they're really de detoxifiers. I mean, I'm, I'm not sure, I mean, Sherim is working on it. It's a more complex um, issue, but there is this component of, of really... Um, I mean, in, if you take a traditional medicine, for example, they use a lot of um, mushrooms in order to detox the bodies. I mean, already. So I think there. I'm, I'm not an expert in that, but I just want to say there are. I mean, we are confronted with um, issues here. They are older than we are, and and I think it it is worth to to look into both. I mean, the new. Um, new sciences and, and traditional knowledge and in order to understand what might be a solution. So I think it's, I mean, to look into plants, to mushrooms, etc., doesn't hurt. I think that that's going to be sort of, you know, increasingly um, salient because, you know, as we become more post-human, as we become more cyborg and have, you know, different... Bionic, right? Different non-biological components to our body. I, there's, a, um, there's an alternative method of cremation called biocremation, and it uses a really alkaline solution to dissolve the body. And what you get at the end is this kind of white powder. And along with the white powder, there's often sort of these like weird uh, metal parts, right? Like of, of, um, of joints and of implants and other things. And those are sometimes recycled because they sort of come back completely clean. Obviously, it's totally sterile. Um, the person doesn't need them anymore, so they can be recycled. So that's, that's something. I think we, there's one more question, yeah. Yeah, um, I wonder if you could say just a little bit more about this big, big speculative kind of um, theme running through the cryonics industry. I've noticed, in at least a, a, a one section of the rhetoric around prosthetics and more features, but there, there's also this kind of super, again, one thread, there's like a, uh, this um, interest in kind of eliminating all disability with these wildly speculative machines. And a lot of them, of course, are liberating and incredibly useful, but there is also, I get the feeling, um, a rhetoric that feeds our repulsion around dependence of any kind. And, Do you really have a tool to have a 
um, a prosthetic arm that functions like a, a, an octopus tentacle or something. It was always like, wow, that's so interesting. It's so cool to look at. And um, so it has bearing for um, an interest for real prosthetic arms that could be, in fact, ever more efficient and so on. But there's something about um, these promises that go with those prosthetics that is that, that promises to eliminate all disability. Like if you, if you do that, you just scrap this on and you won't need your body anymore. And not only that, you might become this, you know, this like incredibly fantastical creature. And it's great. I, there's something to celebrate about it, but there's also something in it that just um, invites us to leap over any kind of need, you know, any kind of decline because of aging and death. I, I, just, I feel like there's this continuity there that we don't, there's not enough critical, you know, um, response that we don't sort of get in a natural way, um, along the way. Is that I mean, they clearly gloss over what that dependence becomes, or what that what it means to then become more cyborg and more posthuman. Um, the speculation in cryonics is actually there are two different speculations that are, you know, I think, what the, the, you know, I criticize it being faith based. And one is that um, nanotechnology will develop to such an extent that cells can be repaired, cells that have died can be repaired um, on a <coughs> nano molecular molecular level. And the other speculation is that our brains can be downloaded, right, and then re-uploaded into a different body. Um, and, and neither one of those have been even remotely proven to, to be possible. Um, and that's, I think that that's where sort of my critique comes from, is that it's entirely faith-based. There's no, I mean, nanotechnology is, is Bible technology. It's very useful. Um, it's been proven in medicine and to be effective in medicine in another field, but in terms of Rejuvenation, reanimation, um, it hasn't been. I think there's still a lot to research and uh, we won't solve that tonight and I think one point would also be to see uh, in what kind of research um, funds and grants are going, uh, which direction research is basically developed. I mean that's also very strongly dependent on funding, state and public and uh, um, also private funding of course and I think that determines also where we investigate um, other solutions or alternative solutions, but I think it's it's very interest. It was very interesting to me to hear somebody from our community, but also to hear you coming from chemistry and law, dealing with Sloan, dealing with DASP, etc. To see that there are shared um, concerns and, and shared agencies, and I think it's important to to channel those voices more together to maybe reach out uh, in a more concerted. Way so, I really want to thank both of you for lending us uh, your time tonight and um, talking to us about those important issues. And I also want to thank uh, Wendy and Marcia Jacobs who took us on a number of mushroom uh, hunts and forays uh, to learn more about the incredible um, this incredible species and. Uh, so nice that you also came tonight and thank you all and I hope you will come back uh, after spring break.